Hello and welcome to another Looney Tunes review video. If you are new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to follow my journey to review all 1000 classic Looney Tunes shorts and give this video a like as well. So this is a review for Those Were Wonderful Days, released in 1934. It's the 78th in the series and it's directed by Bernard Brown. A restoration has popped up on the MeTV servers. Hopefully one day we'll see this beautiful restoration on a Blu-ray set. In case you haven't seen this one, I can't show you the full thing here as the cartoon is under copyright. But essentially what happens is we see reminiscence of the good old days. In this case, reminiscing from the 1930s of the days of the late 19th century. So the 1890s and the early 20th century. And after we see a few gags relating to that sort of thing, we then see a little story at the end involving a mustache twirling villain. So first up, you're going to see a re-edit of the original commentary I did before I had to take that down. Then you'll hear some new thoughts from me, and I definitely missed a lot when I actually did the original commentary, so there's quite a bit to go through. And then you hear from my good friend Manny Cruz, the Toonie Tenor, who will discuss the music in this short. So without further ado, let's get into it. Um, this cartoon is one of, the, one of those nostalgia-type cartoons. Y you might have seen a Walt Disney cartoon in the past, the Mickey Mouse one called the Nifty 19, 19s, or 90s, something like that, anyway, uh, where it was like a nostalgia trip for the um, early 20th century, and this is pretty similar to that. So this one is... Well, we're back, first of all, back to black and white, and I do have to point out this uh, <laughs> really... Um, curvaceous animation right here where she's basically singing about that uh, women used to be more like Mae West who was very who was get yeah, quite uh, voluptuous like like so it's also like uh, people in the 70s were being nostalgic for the 50s and hence you've had shows like Happy Days and movies like American Graffiti so this came, came out in 1934 so people would have very much re remembered um, these good old days, as they probably might put it. There's definitely a charm about these. Um, it's basically a bygone era's look at a bygone era. Of course, this is my kind of picnic right here. I mean, with the free beer. I mean, wow. Those really were the days. <laughs> this is this is really like weird design for for the um, for man, and um, obviously he wants a bit of that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you know what he wants. It's such a st stereotype villain. I mean, you know, with the top hat, the cape, and the mustache. I mean, my goodness, that's weirdly animated. I wonder if this was worked on earlier on uh, with with Tom Palmer because it looked like more like what Tom Palmer did when when he made his um, two shorts before he was fired. Maybe this was this was the start of something else and. They just scrapped most of it and they took over. I, I don't know. So he kidnapped her. They've gone up in the balloon. She nearly dies, of course, but she's saved. And there's a bit of a plot twist, which makes no sense. Point, but if, if, if I'm missing something, please point it out in the comments below. So of course he he hits him, but she hits him, and she wants him. So those are my original thoughts, and as mentioned, yes, I did miss quite a bit. But first of all, in terms of the cartoon itself, it does feel like it's another case of Pen in the Park, where you've got this seemingly one cartoon, but then it just turns into something else towards the end. At least in this case, thematically, it's about the same. It just appears that there was this one cartoon, just rolling gags around you know, the turn of the century, and then this other one where it's about this mustache twirly villain trying to kidnap a woman. But at least thematically they're the same, but it just feels like it's from two separate things. Like they started one thing and just added in another. If you look at the beginning of it, it looks as though Frank Tashlin may have directed this or at least had a strong hand in it because a lot of the character designs were pretty much how Tashlin drew at the time. And yet at the very end of it, the character designs look a little bit more different, look a little bit more wonkier. In fact, they look very similar to those infamous Tom Palmer shorts where he did those two shorts and then he got fired because his shorts were just so terrible. I don't know what happened here. There's no records to say what happened. 
because Bernard Brown is involved with the music in the shorts and yet he's got director's credit. So it's possible Tashler may have started this. He then got fired over his Tish Tash comic and probably something else as well. And that's put a director's credit, so they gave it to Bernard Brown. But anyway, that information's probably lost to time. So essentially, as I touched upon in the commentary, the short is basically the equivalent to perhaps how the 80s are viewed today, with a lot of the 80s nostalgia, or even music in a lot of films. I notice it's got that sort of 80s vibe to it. So and it's similar to how in the 70s there was the whole 50s revival, the whole nostalgia thing with Happy Days, American Graffiti, and that sort of thing. Keep in mind, this short came out in 1934, and there were still plenty of people alive that were from the previous century. You can imagine a lot of people watching this might have just reminisced and gone, well, I, I remember that, I remember that. There are quite a few references here that appear to be of the turn of the century. It's possible I missed one or two, and there were a couple in there I couldn't quite get, but you guys can help me out with that in the comments if you know more than me about this, <laughs> because I'm not an expert on the turn of the century, American culture, but I did my research and hopefully everything is correct. So in the beginning, we do see two boxers eventually dance and punch each other out and nicely into the tune of the title song. We see the name Kilrain and Sullivan, and that refers to real boxers, Jake Kilrain and John Sullivan, who battled each other in 1889 in a bare-knuckled match where this was before boxing gloves came into effect. And no, I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert in boxing, but as I understand it, their boxing originally was just bare-fisted, and later on, boxing gloves came into it. Though here, for some reason, they're wearing boxing gloves, but I guess I'll just do the whole Simpsons reference. hope somebody will fire for that blunder. But anyway, but that's who they're referencing regardless. Then we see the Cherry Sisters, and I looked it up, and... Apparently, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's a reference to a real-life vaudeville act called the Cherry Sisters, and there were, apparently, the act was really notorious for just how awful it was, and a newspaper outlet that criticised the act was actually sued by the sisters, though the sisters ended up losing, and that's considered to be a landmark decision in the right of fair comment by the press. Now, another reference in that particular frame, you see Kid McCoy, and Kid McCoy was a real-life boxer who sadly had a troubled later life, and it seems to be a common theme among a lot of boxers. As soon as they achieve success after that, you know, this seems to be a lot of issues, but anyway, we won't get into that. He was apparently married 10 times, and I actually just finished reading an Elizabeth Taylor book where you know, she was married quite a few times, and I was like, wow, okay, well. Elizabeth Taylor, eat your heart out, I guess. I'm looking at all this shaving cream, and first of all, I don't know why all these references are on shaving cream. Again, if you guys know, let me know. I can't seem to see what's so thematic here regarding the shaving cream, but from what I can see here, and given that some of these names may be a bit more common, it could be referring to someone else, so hopefully I got this right, but looks like L. Jennings was an attorney who ended up becoming a silent film star, I'm not sure on Mark Kelly, because again, it's a really common name, and I'm looking up references in the year, late 1800s, early 1900s, I can't seem to find anything on that. Al Smith looks to be a reference to the former governor of New York and the Democratic Party nominee of 1928. Now, Steve Brody, I found two references for someone that's in the late 1800s that could be it here. I think it's the baseball player that played for the Baltimore Orioles, Orioles, O-R-I-O-L-E-S, sorry, I can't even pronounce that, or a British champion diver and British jumper that was considered to be one of the best of the era. But like I said, I think it's most likely the baseball player given the theme here, but yeah, it could be either one. But again, no idea what that has to do with shaving cream, but yeah, again, you can let me know in the comments. Now, a cakewalk, a lot of folks might look at that. Bear in mind, this is Blink and you miss it, so probably the only person out there looking it up and giving you the reference is me, but a cakewalk. Okay, so the participants would walk around a path in time to music, which plays for duration, then stops. A number is drawn at random and called out, and the person standing on that number wins a cake as a prize. So it's like basically a game. And later on, as we see the sign about this you know, picnic in the park, we get a nice little showcase of the various modes of transportation at the time. So we've got the old automobile, which would have been 
only to the well-to-do, the people who could actually afford that sort of thing. And we even see penny farthing. So it's a nice little historical reference there, Robert. Yeah, the mode of transportation, of course, most people walked anyway. Or horse and carriage was definitely a more popular mode of transportation at this particular time. But, of course, give it a few decades and the automobile would take over. You know, this cartoon's actually quite strange. And another reason why I suspect Tashin had a strong hand in this one, it just comes across it with his sort of sensibilities. If you look at the films he made later on, once he actually got into live action directing, the kinds of women that he used, well, they were definitely on the bustier side. It's in like the girl can't help it and that sort of stuff. Looking at this short, there was definitely a love for the, I guess, shapely ladies. Quite a few here, in fact. So I don't know, I, I still suspect that's another reason why I think he started this short or had a very strong hand whether he directed it or not and boy oh boy they really try and milk all of these jokes of course you got the lady in the beginning as part of the song which makes sense because she's referencing Mae West who had that kind of figure and that was the lyric in the song that she sings but then we see that really really weird free lunch gag where the, the guy just snatches up a free lunch and then later on he just it's the lunch on her yeah yeah you'll see it You'll definitely see it. And later on, you see even one holding her kids on her, yeah, rear. But then you see the, the lady in the later half of the cartoon, and she's not busty, really. So that's why I think this was just from something else entirely, and it was just put together. It just happened to have the same theme. But what about some of the other stuff? I mean, my favorite gag is definitely, and I mentioned this in the commentary, but... The free beer. There's a party right there. But also that guy just drinking the beer and just turning fat. Is it silly? Yeah. But I like it. I like it. What I wasn't a huge fan of, that fancy diving bit that comes next. It was okay, but it didn't make me laugh or anything. I think that there could have been more to it. Maybe somebody else finished it. Maybe Tasha tried to do something, but yeah, whatever. But let's look at the last part of the cartoon. So we've got this vaudeville stereotypical villain, your know, moustache twirling, -ha -ha, tie the woman to a t train tracks kind of villain that you, you see quite often, and of course he even looks at her ear at one point. Yeah, it's definitely uh, pre haze Code as well, where the haze Code would have uh, probably said no-no to a lot of the gags in this short. And then we, we see just a pretty standard, I guess, fight between the hero and the villain. We get a very silly bizarre fight around the balloon as well and parts of it, it seemingly it's like it's at a circus so again it feels like it's a different setting altogether although there is one shot later on which kind of establishes there's something in this park but anyway but the most bizarre thing of this short aside from how the hero just casually glides down is the very odd ending so you got this guy trying to kidnap this girl and the hero knocks him down, and then she feels sorry for the villain. The villain wins. Very odd. Very. All right. I've been proudly long, long enough. So here's my good friend Manny Cruz the Tuny Tenor, and who is an expert on music, and so of course loves his cartoons. And he is going to discuss the music since this short is promoting a song. So take it away, Manny. Hi everyone. This is Manny Cruz of the Tuny Tenor coming at you with the latest edition of It's Time for Manny's Music Time with music trivia for you today. I keep singing a little bit higher and higher as the day goes on. I don't know, I did four masses this morning by myself and a lot of singing, a lot of warming up to do, so. <laughs> but I'm here to talk about, not liturgical music, but I'm here to talk about the 1934 Merry Melody. Those were wonderful days, directed once again by Bernard Brown. And before I go any further, I do want to say that if you want to learn a little bit more information about Bernard Brown, his career working in sound editing at Warner Brothers as well as Universal, I would highly recommend you check out the commentary for Petting in the Park that I did a while back that goes more into explaining about his life and career because he was not a director. He was just pretty much a body that was available to cover for some of the turmoil that was going on in the Schlesinger unit at the time. So let's talk about this cartoon. There were several cues and... There was some information that I've decided to hold off until uh, later commentaries because I want to really get into the meat and potatoes of some of these specific composers at a later time. 
After hearing the opening Mary Melody's theme of I Think You're Ducky, immediately when the cartoon starts, you get to hear a little bit of Auld Lang Syne. As most people think of it, oh, it's a song that everybody sings on New Year's. So Auld Lang Syne is a song of Scottish origin dating back to the 1700s. And the phrase itself, I don't, don't believe there's an, a, a literal translation to it, but it's pretty much a way of saying a long time ago or once upon a time. And like I said, it's ubiquitous in the English speaking world during uh, New Year's. And I know it pretty well, being a big fan of Ghostbusters, in Ghostbusters 2, they sang Auld Lang Syne and all the positivity coming from the people outside the Manhattan Museum of Art. They were singing that. It started to weaken all the psychomagnetic mood slime. And Vigo the Carpathian started getting weaker. And the Ghostbusters were able to stop. Okay, I'm completely going on a tangent. But I do love Ghostbusters too. But that song's in the film, so it makes sense. Anywho, the title track itself. Those were wonderful days. It was written by Murray Mencher and T Charles Tobias. Now, those two names are very important in Warner Brothers history in terms of music. I'm going to hold off talking about them more. For a later commentary, here's your clue. Billboard Frolics. And I'm not going to say any more. The title track, sadly, there is no commercial recording available for it. If you want to listen to the song, watch this cartoon. Another song that you hear in a lot of Warner Brothers cartoons is Oh You Beautiful Doll, which was written by Nat Ayer and it was published in 1911. It was actually originally a song from Broadway and it was used several years prior as part of one of the screen songs from Max Fleischer. And when I was doing research into it, I was under the assumption that this song was older than what I thought it was. I thought this was a song that was written sometime maybe in the 30s. I hear, oh, you beautiful doll, you. That melody has been used in multiple Warner Brothers cartoons. I assumed it was a later date of publication than I thought, but oh well. The next one you hear is Chopsticks, which is what pretty much every beginning piano student considers one of the songs that they master <laughs> back in the day. Heck, I still play it once in a while when I'm bored. You start off on E and F on the piano, dun, 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 dun. go to E and G, dun, 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 dun. then D to B, dun, 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 dun. and I did a little bit more digging into Chopsticks, and I actually didn't know the actual origin of the song itself. It was published in 1877. It was composed by a British composer by the name of Arthur DeLuly, and he used a pseudonym of Euphemia Allen. And the song was actually originally titled The Celebrated Chop Waltz, because the song, it's a waltz. It's in three, four time, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You could think of stuff like the Blue Danube Waltz. You could think of the Waltz of the Flowers from Tchaikovsky. Blue Danube is from Johann Strauss. Think of a corny concerto, that cartoon, boom, Blue Danube Waltz. Tales from the Vienna Woods, another one from A Corny Concerto. And that song, Chopsticks, you hear it in the scene where the man, I'm assuming the bartender, he's playing around with the, the cash register and it looks like he's playing the piano. Now, of course, my mind goes to Rhapsody Rabbit <laughs> in the scene where the mouse is hiding underneath the lid of the piano. And he starts playing chopsticks and Bugs puts the piece of dynamite inside the lid to try to kill the mouse. And then the mouse starts playing <laughs> taps on the piano. And then he hits Bugs in the head with the mallet. Great cartoon. Now here's another song that, again, I assumed was not as old as I thought it was. Put on Your Old Gray Bonnet, which was uh, published in 1909. The music was written by Percy Wenrich. Wenrich? Wenrich. 
Let's go with that. Percy Wenrich. And the lyrics were by Stanley Murphy. And that's the part of the cartoon where you see the cops. It gives me vibes like the Keystone Cops. They're walking the beat, and they start hitting their batons on their helmets. I thought that was pretty funny. I like that scene. I don't know. There's something about the energy of it I thought was pretty cool. But hearing put on your old gray bonnet, it was nice. When I think of that melody, again, it's another song that's been used in various Warner Brothers cartoons, but two that come to mind for me is The Bear's Tale from Tex Avery in 1940, that when you see Mama Bear, you hear her put on your old gray bonnet. And of course, how could you forget the best version of it in Warner Brothers cartoons with <laughs> Bugs Bunny and the Big Bad Wolf from 1944's Little Red Riding Rabbit. Just hearing Mel Blanc and Billy Bletcher sing their rendition of Put On Your Old Grey Bond and Billy Bletcher just gets lost in the sauce, so to speak. It's, oh, it's one of my favorite scenes in that cartoon. Put on your old grey bond and we're going to be a famous old girl we told her what to say. Through the fields of clover we ride back to town. Now here's another song that once again is older than what I thought. And what's interesting is that some of these songs would have been songs that were from that time period because this cartoon is set in the gay 90s not the 1990s which is my childhood growing up in the 90s i'm showing my age but let's go back 100 years prior to the 1890s so this cartoon is one of those kind of longing for the nostalgia of 40 years past kind of like what we're doing now where we have all this nostalgia of the 1980s and the 1990s yeah, some of these songs would have been around during that time period, but some of them, it's an anachronism. Put on your old gray bonnet and this one in the shade of the old apple tree, which was published in 1905. The music by Egbert, what a great name, Egbert Van Alstein or Alstein and lyrics by Harry Williams. Now, this cartoon, it's not the best cartoon in the world. When I was rewatching this one, it's been years since I've seen Those Were Wonderful Days, unfortunately. I got to see a better copy of it now. It's, it was recently remastered in HD. But it just reminded me a lot of a later cartoon that has the theme of the gay 90s. Um, Love and Curses by Ben Hardaway and Cal Dalton, 1938. The three main characters, the couple and the dirty cur, as I like to call him. It's like Hardaway and Dalton saw this cartoon and was like, hey, let's pretty much take those character designs, tweak them a bit and reuse it and change up the plot a bit. And yeah, just this cartoon, it's like when I was watching and hearing the music or seeing the visuals, I'm like, oh, it reminded me of this one. Oh, it reminded me of this one. Like the scene where you see the two boxers in the painting skating, it made me think of a later cartoon. I think it was one of the Tashlin cartoons that reused the animation from that scene. But for In the Shade of the Old Apple Tree, made me think of probably the best version of the song in Warner Brothers short, Chuck Jones's directorial debut, The Night Watchman from 1938. And the scene where the mice and the rats, forget which one's probably rat. Oh, rat, mice. I don't know. Same thing. Sorry, Mickey, Jerry, Master Splinter. Don't get offended. But <laughs> that's probably my favorite rendition of that particular song. And that was during the scene where they were getting the free beer. And once again, thinking of another cartoon, free beer, I'm thinking of One Froggy Evening. The gag where the guy was trying to get everybody to come inside the theater. It's like, hey, free beer. It doesn't work on me because I don't drink, but... If it was like free Coke Zero, that'd be a different story. <laughs> Three other cues that uh, I wanted to mention. There was one called Bedella by a composer named Schwartz, but I couldn't find the first name of the composer, and I wasn't sure specifically where. The cue itself is six seconds long, but I didn't want to take a wild guess. I didn't have a recording to reference to, but two other ones that were in it was Dreaming by Stephen Daly, and that was the song you hear during the scene where the lady is swinging on the tree, and the guy is sleeping underneath her, and his stomach is expanding and up and down. He breathes like a singer. He kind of looks like me when I'm about to sing a high note. Well, minus the sleeping part, which is what I'm going to be doing after this recording. (laughs) 
And the other one, too, is Hi Nelly by Ali Rubel. Now, Ali Rubel is another composer that's pretty extensive that I want to talk about at a later time because he worked in films. He's worked at Warner Brothers, Disney, some other things. And he's one of those that I want to save for. I don't want to say it's raining outside right now where I live in uh, New Jersey, but let's save him for another time because I want to really dig deeper on a later date. So yeah, those are my thoughts for those were wonderful days. I hope you enjoyed this commentary. This little, I don't want to say a deep dive, but like skimming the surface thing into the music of this cartoon. I hope you enjoyed it. Please uh, follow me on my socials at the Toonie Tenor. And thanks again for all the support. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the commentary. And it was cool seeing, I'm trying to remember if the version of this cartoon I had prior to this HD version that I saw had the dirty cur going so long folks or whatever he did but it was it's always cool to see that now these older merry melodies are being um, restored you get to see the original endings it's kind of neat so I'm trying to remember how he did it but here's my best job I'm, I'm trying to twirl my beard but my the mustache part of my beard is not that long so let's just go with it <laughs> oh man so that's all folks I think that's what he did whatever <laughs> enjoy Adios. So long, folks. Thank you, Manny. So this short is definitely a bit of a mixed bag. It's not a bad one. It's more interesting, I guess, than funny. And it's definitely got its amusing bits, you know, like the use of the ladies in this one, and the beer gag, and of course, just the crazy, just honestly, it's an insane ending. But this one gets about six and a half out of ten. Again, it's not a standout. It's more fascinating, if anything, and it also provides an interesting what if. If Tashlin really did start to direct this, what would the whole short have been like had he been able to do it? Similar to Penny in the Park, which he was also suspected of doing. But in any case, that will do it for this one. Let me know what you think of the short below in the comments. And until next time, take care.